For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. Why would God chasten us in judgment? That we should not be condemned with the world. It's to save us. <clears throat> Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Now this is a verse you want to mark down. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. This is a verse you want to mark down when people accuse you of judging. It's an important passage. A second one, which we won't turn to, is chapter 6, verse 2. Chapter 6, verse 2. If you cannot judge, then you know what you are? You are not a spiritual person. Didn't you know that? Are you kidding me? No, I'm not kidding you. If you cannot judge others, then you are not a spiritual person. <clears throat> That's why it makes sense. Why is it that the world's getting worse and worse in sin? Why is there more and more wrong doctrine spreading? Because there's no one who's judging what is right and wrong. It's more about toleration. Don't judge it. Leave it alone. That's why don't blame God and wonder why, why, why when we live in a very fleshy, wicked world. Your fault. The Bible says in verse 15, <coughs> But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Chapter 6, verse 2, which you don't have to turn to, it says, Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world, and if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? See that? We, we're supposed to judge the world. That's our job. You are supposed to judge. Now, look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Judge not, lest ye be judged. How many of you have heard that? They always use that line over and over again to prove that Christians should not judge. Don't judge me. Don't judge me. But the problem with that is if you look at the context, did they look at the context of verses 2 through 5? Not only that, Compare that with this passage as well. Combine it with this passage. When you look at verses 2 through 5 and this passage, it'll show you the context. Why you cannot judge. It's when it comes to hypocrisy. If you're committing the same action, then you have no right to judge. That's the idea. Now look at Matthew chapter 7. And we will read verse 1. This is their proof text. You'll hear this over and over again. <clears throat> Judge not that ye be not judged. Now, look at verse 2. Why? For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And look at 3, 4, and 5. See that? If you judge them at verse 2, it's going to come back to you. 3 and 4, it says, why are you being a hypocrite judging another person when you got a problem? Verse 5 calls you hypocrite. First, get rid of the beam in your own eye. Then you're going to see the moat in your brother's eye. Sometimes we judge a little sin problem from somebody else when we got a big one ourselves. That's hypocritical. That's why God says don't judge. But then when you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 15, you might remember where it says... In that passage, what? That a Christian is going to not be judged of no man. He that spiritual judge all things, but he is judged of no man. In 1 Corinthians 2.15, that's why you compare that with this one, it makes sense. So 1 Corinthians 2.15 tells you you're supposed to judge, but the idea is you don't be hypocritical in doing so. Now, here's a powerful one. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 through 15. And then, we're not going to look at this, but chapter 6, verse 2 is another passage. Guess who has the right to judge? Christians. But guess who doesn't have the right to judge? The world. How about that? You know why? When the world condemns you, for judging against their sin, they're the ones who should be condemned for judging you. Oh, don't judge me. And then you tell them, why are you judging me just now? And you tell them that actually that they don't have a right to judge you, but you got a right to judge them. 
Because that's what the word of God says. Because you're in the right. They're in the wrong. Not only that, only saints has the right to judge. Those who are God's people has the right to judge. Not the lost world who's living in sin. So if you're part of the lost world, why is it that they judge you every day in the news, huh? Why is it they judge you every day in school? Oh, we have a right to critique. But then when you preachers preach against their sin, then they accuse you for judging them? That is a twist in mindset. Actually, God wants it the other way around, that we're supposed to judge, not the world. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and we'll read verse 12. <clears throat> now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. So we have the Holy Ghost, thus we know. And verse 14, but the natural man, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. See, a natural, everyday man who is not spiritual, in his case, he does understand the spiritual things of God. <coughs> For they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, <coughs> because they are spiritually discerned. So see, a lost man does not know spiritual things. But in verse 12 and 13, a saved person knows the spiritual things. That's why in verse 15, you can judge. He that is spiritual judgeth all things. Why? Because he knows spiritual things. That's why he has the right to judge in spiritual matters. But the lost world does not know the spiritual things. The natural man does it. That's why they have no right to judge you. What a twisted world we live in, amen? They have everything backwards. Okay, we're going to look at... Several things that we are supposed to be judging on. Now, we're not going to turn here for time's sake, but we're going to look at several things to judge others. So here are the right things to judge others. So what should I judge, Pastor? Well, these are the things you should be judging others on. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 1 through 3. Again, we're not going to turn there for time's sake. You know what you should be judging? Sin. Don't let sin go wild, amen? Sin has to be judged. Must be pointed out. Another thing, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2. Another thing right here is supposed to be wrong doctrine. Wrong doctrine. Doctrine divides the church. No, you got to judge that. God says it must be judged. Hmm. <coughs> <clears throat> Romans chapter 14, verse 13. Romans 14, verse 13. People you're held responsible for. Now, this is extremely important because that's why parents have more spoiled kids. Why? They don't judge them. Pastors have messed up members. Why? They don't judge them. Governmental leaders, if you're a, a leader of a business organization, if you're a husband, you're responsible to make sure that your wife submits to the right things and follows you in a Christian, or, in a Christian godly manner. Obviously not in an abusive, stupid manner. But these are people you're held responsible for and you're supposed to judge them. If you don't judge, then you're in the wrong. That's why houses are messed up. Our nation is messed up. Schools are messed up. Churches are messed up. Why? People don't judge on what they're responsible for. Things that burden the brethren. Now, this is very important to understand, is that what you need to judge others on is if they're burdening other people in the church, not on nitpicking their faults and different beliefs, etc. This one in the church is things that burden the church. That's what you should be judging on. So if someone acts like some judgmental, nitpicky, critical person, you got to judge that person and say, hey, brother and sister, we're trying to enjoy a great time in church. Things that hurt the church. Now, if there's a sin that's committed in this church that actually hurts the church as a whole, that has to be approached. That has to be judged. 
And that includes a pastor. If a pastor commits some kind of major sin in the church that hurts the church as a whole, that has to be judged. Now again, everyone has faults and differences, but this is an issue that hurts the church. That's the idea. If it hurts the church, that has to be judged. Now here are some wrong things to judge others on. Some wrong things to judge others. So, this is the most important point out of the whole teaching. You might say, really? I thought that the blue might be the right one, the right things to judge. That would be most important. One thing I learned is this, is that Bible believers, they don't have a problem to judge because they have all the knowledge. So because you have all the knowledge of the scriptures, it's easy to judge. So I don't think that's a problem with us. I think <clears throat> if you're not knowledgeable of the scriptures, then this is your problem right here. If you're a fleshy, carnal Christian, this is your problem. And you got to start judging. Bible believers who are zealous for the Lord, surrender to the Lord, and they're on fire, this is the most important point to you. Whereas this is for the carnal Christian, this one's more for the spiritual Christian. John chapter 12. Turn to your Bibles to John chapter 12. We're going to look at verse 48. And then there's Romans chapter 14, verse 3, 6, and 8. Now here's one of the wrong things that you shouldn't judge. A particular liberty. Christians should have liberty. Or conviction. Everyone has different convictions. Everyone has freedom to do something. A liberty or conviction that's not 100% if you're not 100% sure. 100% sure that it's sin or heresy. If you don't think that the conviction the brother or sister in Christ holds on to is 100% heresy, 100% sin, not wrong to you. See, that's a conviction. See, what you personally believe. But if it's a sin or heresy, that blatant, and you're 100% sure that's the case, then you should not judge that. Sometimes people might watch something, play with something. Sometimes people might celebrate a certain day. And sometimes people might uh, believe some kind of different teaching in the Bible. But if that's not 100% sin or 100% heresy, you know what you should do? You shouldn't judge that. You shouldn't judge that. Look at John chapter 12, verse 48. The Bible says, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. <coughs> the word that I have spoken, the same, shall judge him in the last day. Now look at Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14 and verse 3. Romans chapter 14. And we'll read verse 3. Notice right here <clears throat> that it's based on the Word of God. Did you notice that? It is based on the Word of God. So here's the thing is that did the Bible specifically 100% say in the Bible about that certain day, about that certain game or video or what they're seeing or etc.? Did the Bible specifically say that? Sometimes people might want to drink a lot of coffee and other people might drink shorter amounts of coffee. But here's the thing is that everyone has liberty to do so on what day they observe, what diet they eat. We had people in our church who eat meat and other people who were vegetarians. So there's conviction as well. Sometimes they believe in a certain teaching in the Bible that they feel convicted teaches in this way, whereas another person will think differently. So you got to realize this. If it's very clear in the Bible, that's what it's based on. The, the judgment is based on the Bible. But if it's 100%, not 99%, 100% that's sin, sin, not difference, heresy, heresy, not difference, then that's going to be judged against you, Jesus pointed out, because it's based on the Word of God. But look at Romans 14. Look at the difference here. Verse 3. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. 
And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. See that? It doesn't matter what you eat. Verse 6. He that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not and giveth God thanks. See, it doesn't matter which day you regard or what food you eat. Let's also look at verse 8. For whether we live, see, everything you do in this life, we live unto who? The Lord. the Lord. If you can do that with a clean conscience to the Lord, then God honors that liberty and conviction because it's unto the Lord, whatever you do, no matter what, how different it is. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the who? Mm -hmm. Lords, that's the point. If it's honoring to God, one person feels this honors God, and this pleases him, and he can do that for the Lord. Let him drink, let him eat the way he wants to, uh, observe the day that he wants to, do his daily activity. You see how we can point out what's wrong with worldly things and we preach against certain worldly things? We can do that more because a person in his or her heart and conscience, they know, ooh, what's wrong with that? They can't do that 100% for the Lord. That's why it's extremely important that this is something that you can do for the Lord. And if it does and it's different from you, leave that brother and sister in Christ alone. Look at Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 12. Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 12. Another thing that you shouldn't judge. Another thing that you shouldn't judge <coughs> is something that your love can put up with. Something that your love can put up with. Sometimes people who act judgmental, they don't have enough love. You got to love the brother and sister in Christ and just leave it alone. Sometimes there's going to be people in the church who are a little weird. Sometimes there's going to be some person who attended this church for five years and they still act a little burdensome. Maybe they sound too spiritual for you too. But you got to understand this, we all love each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. Whether the brother or sister in Christ is weaker or stronger, you got to put up with each other and love one another. So don't judge on that matter. Look at this, hatred stirreth up strifes, but love covereth what? Wow, you should memorize that before you open up your mouth. People don't have, a lo people don't have love, that's the problem. Am I in the right church? I thought that this pastor kicks against sin and preaches hard against wrong doctrine. Am I in the right church? Yeah, you're in the right church, okay? We're looking at the Bible, not on Gene Kim. We're looking at the Bible here. What does the Bible say? Either you kick, you kick. You love, you love. That should be the case. All bound by the Word of God. Look at John chapter 7, verse 51. John chapter 7, verse 51. Now, this one I don't understand. I've been in churches all of my life as a pastor and not as a pastor. And you know what Christians have a problem with? They judge something they partially understand. Yeah. Everyone thinks that they know the whole issue. They know what's going on. What's going on in brother and sister so-and-so's life. No, you don't. Shut up. Mind your own business. Yeah. This is a problem with people, okay? They think that they know what's going on. No, you don't, okay? Look at John chapter 7, verse 51. Problem with people. Just be quiet. Shut up, okay? I don't care what brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so is doing. I don't want to know. Just shut up, okay? Don't judge the person over what you partially understand. Sometimes people talk about deep doctrines of the Bible, and they've been only saved for less than a year. Not only that, they don't even know the basic doctrines of the Bible. And they feel like that they have a right to judge something on a deep doctrine on what's right. That's a partial understanding. Look at John chapter 7, verse 51. Doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? See, before you judge, what you got to do is, are you putting yourself in that other person's shoe? Do you know exactly all the details that's going on in that person's life? Or did you just assume by their behavior and their reaction that's the kind of person they are? Okay, let's look at 
1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So when it comes to doctrine, political beliefs, conspiracy theories, personal studies with the Bible or online studies of the Bible or somebody's wrongdoing that you observe, look, man, don't judge over a partial understanding. Once you judge and you misunderstand what's really going, what's really going on in the person's life, do you know how much of a mess you're going to create in the whole church? It's not just you and the person, it's the whole church. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and then we're going to look at verse 29 to 30. Don't judge unwisely that allows others to find a legitimate fault. Now, did you hear what I just said right there? You got to be very careful with your mouth, especially when you post stuff online. See, I don't kick somebody irrationally online or stupidly. You got to realize this. The world wants to find a legitimate fault with you. Sometimes there are arrogant preachers in churches and arrogant street preachers who try to think that they're preaching against sin and wrong doctrine, but instead the world finds a legitimate fault with them that those guys are jerks. Those guys are idiotic. They just want to stir up controversy deliberately. I mean, I know of idiotic pastors some of them weird cultic fringes, and they don't submit to anybody but themselves. They would say stuff like that homosexuals cannot get saved. I'm glad that they got killed. Other people, when they preach publicly on the street saying faggot, queer, dyke, and stuff like that, I mean, pointing out women who don't dress right, like whore, whore, whore. I mean, what in the world, okay? Well, I'm biblically right for doing so. You don't want to judge something that gives you a legitimate fault. All right? You don't want to give a legitimate fault. And if you're involved in that kind of a church, leave. Yeah. That is a weird, cultic, strange, messed up kind of church that you should go away from. All right, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 29 and then through 30. I just made an NIV mistake right there. So, like, uh, <laughs> there we go. All right. 1 <laughs> Corinthians chapter 10. And then we'll read verses 29 through 30. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I what? Evil spoken of for that which I give thanks. So notice that when there's judgment at verse 29, you cannot be evil spoken of at verse 30. How many, how much... Did NBC News speak evil of certain messed up Christians, so-called Christians, who say stupid, controversial things? Okay, let's also look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 3. Did you learn something from tonight's teaching? Yes, sir. This is important stuff. You don't want to judge, especially... When you watch so many things online and then post stuff online, you got to be extremely careful with that. I mean, once you put something, that's public for everybody to see. And you don't want to bring a disgrace to the name of Christianity. We've got 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We'll read verse 3. Another thing that you shouldn't judge <clears throat> is the little flaws of fellow brethren who are on the same side as you. Okay, so here's the idea. Don't major on minorities and don't minor on the major. H have you ever heard that before? So minor issues. So let's put minor things or minors. That'll be better. There are Christians who major in judging minor issues. And then there are pastors who unfortunately minor judgment on major issues. That's the problem with churches today. So because Christians have such an imbalance in all those things, that's why you've got to learn that there are minor issues that you shouldn't judge on. You've got to leave it be. Well, you know, he messed up right here, or he's teaching something right here. Hey, you don't think we're going to find minor things with you that we can judge on? Well, it's not a big deal, and ah, so you think in your case it's not a big deal, but the other person's case, you call it a big deal to you? That's picking and choosing. That's pride. That's selectiveness. That's being an elitist. 
Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 3. For ye are yet what? Carnal. See, that's a sign of a carnal Christian. No, I'm spiritual. No, you're a carnal person. Judging everybody on, oh, where, you didn't come to church early enough. Where were you in prayer meeting? Oh, where were you, brother, sister in Christ? I didn't see you street preaching. Hey, how many souls did you win? I won more souls than you. What you, you teach a little differently right there. I don't like that pastor and I believe differently. Blah, blah, blah. That is a carnal church, a carnal Christian. That's not spiritual. The carnality is pride. Keep reading. For whereas there is among you, what? Envying and strife and divisions. Are you not carnal and walk as men? That's a sign of carnality when there's divisions. Look at verse 4. For while one saith, I am a Paul, and another, I am a Paulus, are ye not what? Carnal. Oh, I'm of so-and-so of this camp. I'm of this kind of church and that kind of church. Look, I don't care if you're from San Jose Bible Baptist Church. Who gives a flip, okay? There are many other Bible-believing churches out there. Doesn't make you elitist, all right? I would love our church to be the best kind of church, but that's a sign of arrogance and pride. And, oh, I'm better, I'm better, I'm better. Yeah, wait till God messes up your preaching, your teaching. He'll humble this church yeah. if you're not careful. Amen. Look at verse 9. For we are laborers, what? Together with God. You're God's husbandry. You're God's building. Let's look at chapter 4, verse 3 through 7. But with me, it is a very, what? Small. Small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self. Look at that. There's, let me ask you this question. Wasn't there something in your life, at least a couple times in your life, that you felt like the person was wrong about and you wanted to judge it, but you let it slide? Is there anything in your judgment that was considered small? That shows you got a mental problem then. You think everything is something to judge about. If there was nothing in your life that you thought that it's a little judgment matter and you just left it be, if you have zero of that in your record, I think the problem is with you. Amen. You're the problem. Okay? It's not the other person's problem. You're the problem. If you're the one that has little judgment and everybody else has big judgment, that shows you got a serious mental issue. You're, fixa you're fixated on yourself. you got an egotistic problem. Let's look at chapter 4, verse 3, and then verse 4. For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified. Paul says, even in the small matter, I'm not saying that I'm right. I'm imperfect. But he that judgeth me is the who? The Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who, will, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts and then shall... Every man have praise of God. Well, amen to that. You see right there? God is the ultimate judge. Everyone's imperfect. Even this pastor's imperfect. If you didn't see anything imperfect in what I post online, I'm Jesus Christ for crying out loud. Everyone's imperfect. I know you're in shock mode. But yes, I'm an imperfect person like you. And if you don't think so, you should teach, okay, with 2,000 videos online. And let me see your world record of perfection. All right, you're going to have everyone's imperfect. Everyone is imperfect. But Paul says, in, the, in these things, we should let the Lord judge. Let him be the ultimate judge. Every time, have you not, when you came on the pulpit to preach and teach, had a fear of the Lord in you? Yeah. Because you were afraid you might mess up on something you teach and preach? Yeah. So don't worry, okay? I know who my judge is, okay? <laughs> If you don't think so, you should preach and teach on the pulpit and see what it feels like. It's not easy. It's not an easy position. It's a lot of pressure. It's a lot of pressure. So, see, let God be the ultimate judge. We're going to look at Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Well, I left that church and that pastor. Why? Oh, because he taught this and that. Oh, okay then. So you think that you do better? Now remember this. We are supposed to judge, amen, concerning wrong doctrine. But come on, if it's a minor issue, 
then you got to leave it be. Well, how do I know that it's a minor issue? How you can tell it's a minor issue is that one, you got to think about this. One, you got to think about, is it enough of an issue where you can risk hurting the church and be divisive over? That's one thing you got to think about. Is it worth fighting for that you go through hurt and the church goes through hurt? There are some doctrines, yes, it must be done. A second thing is this. Was there anything minor in your life that you left as judgment? You left out the judgment and considered it to be minor? How, how much is that in your record? Then you can tell. The Lord's going to give you, hey, we already read the Bible, right? You have the right to judge, amen? Why? Because you have who in you? The Holy Spirit. So it depends on your spiritual growth. When you grow so much more in the Holy Spirit, trust me, you're going to know more and more on what to judge and what not to judge. But if you've been saved for only a short amount of time, and not only that, if you've just had a problem in your life where you have not a lot of spiritual fruits, then you've got to realize this. I'm not as a good in a position to judge like I thought I was. So I can't judge this brother, this sister, this pastor, this preacher right here, stuff like that. Depends on the Holy Spirit in you, how much you have grown. Okay, we'll look at Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, and we'll read verse 5. Here's another thing that you shouldn't judge on. Now, this is going to be probably the most helpful. Don't judge at the wrong time. You ever judge something, let's say your lost Catholic family member, and yeah, they're probably in a damnable religion of Catholicism, but is that the right time to judge it? See, you've got to have a right time of judging things. There is a time where you can know you can judge on, hey, that is wrong, that is heresy. So yeah, it may be a sin and a heresy, but is it the right situation, the right person, the right time? Hmm, see that? Okay, we're going to look at Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 5. Whoso keepeth the commandment shall feel no evil thing, and a wise man's heart, what? Discerneth both, what? Time and judgment. Let's look at verse 6. Because to every purpose there is time and judgment. Therefore, the misery of man is great upon him. Look at chapter 3 and verses 7 through 8. I'm going to go ahead and read it. I'm just going to jump ahead and read it. Notice, isn't this enlightening? A time to rend, a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. See that? Every situation has a right time. Sometimes it's best to keep your mouth shut, and there's a time that you should speak it out. Otherwise, that sin will grow in the camp. See that? So the idea is, think about this. Does your judgment fit with the right place, the right person, the right situation, the right priority, and the right result? Sometimes there are things that you shouldn't judge on because it's not prioritized. It's not at that priority level. Also, what about the result? Will the result turn out right for you if you judge it? That will be the most helpful. All right, if you didn't get that, then rewind this video and write all those things down. The right person, right priority, right situation, right result, right place, etc. The other one is Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. Now, this one is going to be the most helpful before we get into church problems. If you don't want problems in the church, I mean, I've seen that. I've seen it for years. I've been through many churches. And you know what the problem with churches are? Is that sometimes so-and-so will fight with so-and-so. My kid beat up that kid. And then my wife fighting his wife. And then my husband don't get along with that person sitting at the front row. And then so-and-so fight each other during fellowship time when everyone's trying to enjoy a meal. Someone throwing something at brother so-and-so. And then back whispering to some brother and sister to them, well, what about that so strange and stuff like that? I mean, this thing about gossiping to other people so that you can get other people to join you in critiquing that brother and sister in Christ, 
going through secret meetings behind the person's back, you got to realize this. You know what you got to do before there's a split in the church, before you get people leaving the church and don't come back? This is what you got to do. Sometimes you never thought of this before. Don't judge someone that can hurt the church or even their leaders without resolving with the person first. Amen. Yeah. Did you talk to so-and-so? <laughs> then we would have had this problem because maybe there's something you misunderstood about that person. Uh -huh. Oh my goodness. Do you know how much of a headache it is to the pastor when there's something going on and he doesn't know the whole story and then he hears one side from this family, another side from that family, and he doesn't even know what to do? Because he was not there to begin with. Yeah. Look, you guys take resolve it first. Then maybe the thing would have been said a long time ago. Look at Matthew 18, 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, what shall you do? Backbite about him to the brother and sister in Christ. No, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, what happened? Thou hast gained thy brother. Sometimes people don't want to confront the issue. And if you don't want to confront the issue, but you have the guts to backbite about the person or, you know, cause problems in the church and cause an eventual split, it shows your cowardice. If you don't like what's going on with brother and sister and so-and-so, then you should have the guts at least to resolve it between you and that person. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 17. Deuteronomy chapter 17. So don't judge until what? <laughs> you can recover, resolve with the person first. Resolve with the person first. Sometimes a person may be loudmouthed in the church, and if you say, hey, brother, sister in Christ, you know, uh, you know, the, when you talk, it's kind of too loud for me. Could you keep it down? Then maybe the brother and sister in Christ had no idea, and they go, oh, I didn't know I was loud. See that? All right, Deuteronomy chapter 17 and verse 8 through 9, verses 8 through 9. Here's another thing. Don't judge matters you're not suited for. Turn it over to the proper authorities of judging. That's very important. If it's a matter that you're not suited for, you got to turn it over to the proper authorities. Sometimes it's going to take a pastor to take care of the matter and the issue, not you. So you got to make sure that if it's a certain matter you're not suited for, turn it over to the proper authorities of judging. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 17 and verse 8 through 9. Deuteronomy chapter 17. Verses 8 through 9. Well, I don't like how brother and sister so-and-so dressed in the church. Well, hey, man, don't you think the pastor might have already known it and is trying to give the person time? So if you went to the proper authority first, hey, pastor, so-and-so was dressed like this, and you would probably know from the person who's in charge, well, yeah, because the person's a newcomer. Give that person time. Or, yeah, I already talked to so-and-so, but so-and-so won't listen. So what's going to happen? I'm going to have to talk to them again or we're going to have to pray a little longer, or I'm going to have to preach something that the Lord will speak on their hearts. You see that? Sometimes people, they have a judgmental attitude, and they wah, 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 when they should shut up. And you got to realize sometimes the proper authorities already know that. So if you shoot off your mouth and do dumb stuff online, and then gossip through phone calls, and then gossip to other churches and pastors, you know what you're doing, man? What you're doing is that you've hurt and ruin people in the church, including the pastor. You got to realize it's everything under control. So sometimes they know, but they're trying to do it at a right time. See that? Look at Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 8. If there arise a matter too hard for thee in judgment, between blood and blood, between plea and plea, and between stroke and stroke, being matters of controversy within thy gate. See that? If it's going to bring controversy in the church, then it's best that you don't do it. What should you do? Then shalt thou arise and get thee up into the place which the Lord thy God shall choose, and thou shalt come unto who? The priests, the Levites, and unto the judge that shall be in those days. 
and inquire, and they shall show thee the sentence of judgment. See that? Sometimes proper authorities can tell you what to do. Maybe they might give you that judgment too. They might say, well, you know, brother, sister in Christ, that's out of my hands, but that's something that you could probably tell him or her. They might even do that for you. Trust me, if you don't think so, I'm sure they might do that with you. Pastors, they don't like to get involved in trivial issues. They might say, well, you know, pray about it. You take care of that. Because they don't know the whole story and the whole issue, and they don't want to get involved in something ugly. See, you'd be surprised. But that would save you a lot of heartache if you went to them first. Okay, let's also turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Well, actually, we won't turn there for time's sake. We won't turn there for time's sake. But here's an important point that you probably didn't know yourself. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 5. You know who you shouldn't judge? Yourself. Now, are you surprised to hear that? Don't judge yourself. What? Overtly. Now, read that passage if you have the time. If your heart is right with God, then you've got to realize this. Don't be so critical about yourself. Don't be so critical about yourself where you get in a paranoia, where you get worried, where you always get depressed and discouraged. Oh, I'm not right with God. Look, brother, sister in Christ, God knows your heart. Amen? Amen. Now, let me tell you this. It doesn't matter what pastor thinks about you. Can I repeat that again? It doesn't matter what pastor thinks about you. Brother or sister so-and-so thinks about you. you got to realize this. If your heart is right with God, who cares what they think? Sometimes people judge themselves overtly. If your heart's right with God, God knows your heart, then you shouldn't have any fear about the judgment. You should be in peace. Don't live in uh, a paranoia. Now, as we close tonight's teaching, I'm going to talk about exceptions of judging others. Now, there are exceptions to this rule. In life, there are exceptions to rules. If you don't have that in life, then that's why there's going to be paranoia, mercilessness, and people getting hurt. In life, there are exceptions to rules. That's just common sense. So I'm going to tell you about exceptions of judging others. So here's the thing. When you come across these issues, right, and then you're saying, okay, but there is an exception that I have to do. There is an exception where I'm going to probably have to cross this line. Now, remember this, okay? When you cross this line, these are what you should do. If you feel like you're going to violate the rule, if you feel like that you're going to get in trouble, if you feel like that you're not doing the right kind of judgment, these are certain exceptions that you need to follow. The first one is praying to God for wisdom. Praying to God for wisdom. Second Chronicles, we won't turn there for time's sake, Second Chronicles chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. You've got to pray to God for wisdom on the judgment. And guess what happens? You gain more blessings. Didn't you know that? So if you feel like that you're going to violate one of these rules and you're not sure, then that's where prayer comes in. So you've got to pray, and the Lord will give you wisdom on how to handle the matter. Here's an especially helpful one. Luke chapter 6, verse 37, 41 through 44. This one is especially helpful. Look at the fruits of your judging. By their fruits ye shall know them. How do I know that my judging is right? Well, look at the fruit. And does it match with the right kind of judgment or the right kind of judgment? Look at the fruit. How does it appear at the end? I'll tell you what it appears like for some people who act like jerks. People think that Christians are a bunch of hateful, arrogant jerks who are immature children who can't pass the age of 30. That's the problem with people, is that they don't have, they don't look at the fruits. Onliners can be the, one of the most immature people ever. Didn't you know that? Especially onliners. Amen. So look at the fruits of it. Here's another one. Now this one is especially important because it is very easy to judge certain preachers 
sometimes you got to understand this. Judgment is absolutely necessary for a good purpose, can be from God, even if it looks wrong. Now, you got to understand that fact. Even if it looks wrong, sometimes it's absolutely necessary for a good purpose. It can be used of God. If you look at Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 23 through 31, is that God can use something. God can use judgment even if you disagree with it. You might say, why is that, preacher? God can use the judgment even if it's disagreeable. Because in Nehemiah's case, you know what he did with his own church members? He beat them up, he spat on them, and he cursed at them. Now, would you come back to that church after that? <laughs> no, you would go, well, I wouldn't go to that pastor's church. Well, did you read other Great Awakening revival preachers? You know what Peter Cartwright did? He took one liquor merchant, he beat him down to the ground while singing, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. This was during the 1700s, 17, 1800s. <laughs> did you read Martin Luther, his quotes? He called Pope asses, and then he said that he kicked the Pope's throne to hell. So, I mean, look at that guy, okay? Look at that guy. Oh, I don't like Dr. Uckman. Why? Because of the tone of his voice. Oh. You, you did not read Martin Luther long enough, did you? You did not read Peter Cartwright long enough. You've been watching too much Joel Osteen, and that's the brainwashing mentality of people. They think pastors should look like that. Charming, smiling, lovable. Now, here's the ultimate thing at the end with judging, is that just let your heart be right with God. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 31, and then chapter 4, verses 3 through 5. That's the main bottom line with everything, is what is your heart like? And trust me, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. People can tell. People can tell. Well, I know my heart is right with God. Oh, really? You, you arrogant jerk, you? People can see your heart after that. The heart is no secret. People can tell when you're Nehemiah from your heart why you do that. Even to the point of beating up people and spitting at them, all right? People can tell. They look at your heart. Heart is the main issue. If your heart's right with God, you don't have to worry about what people think. So this teaching is about judging others, and I hope that it helped you. All right, your homework assignment is to read, is to listen to the audio. Your audio lesson, Justification for Salvation. Justification for Salvation. Listen to that audio. Some of you already know where to find it. Just go to bbcenglish.org, type down justification. You can listen to the audio. That's your homework assignment. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for thy word. Amazing book and can teach us many things. I pray that today's, tonight's lesson has been especially helpful where we can learn what to properly judge on and what not to judge on. Dismiss us now with your blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone without works through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. 
No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure. You can say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you. Or should we just stick to the Sermon on the Mount? A passage that is so radical that it's doubtful that our own Defense Department would survive its application. King James onlyism is double standards. Now there's a false doctrine out there called dispensationalism. Yeah, I, I don't believe one saved always saved. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. But you don't want to get identified with the reproach of what really believing this Bible is all about. You know what these wicked left-wing liberal perverts want you to do? Legalizing the marijuana or homosexuality or if the whole entire world turns against the Lord. Is that person saved? Is that person on their way to heaven or hell? The common person has no thought of God in their mind. That people will leave the church over the color of the carpet. What's wrong with our churches? Why don't we have a closer walk with Jesus? Why isn't everybody running around like little Jesus is shouting, screaming, and hollering? That thing you look in the mirror, it don't want to go street preaching. It don't want to read the Bible. It don't want to pray. It wants to watch TV and a bunch of other junk. A lot of you don't have it because you're lazy. That's why you don't have it. Because you won't work. That's why. Don't you know the Bible says, Woe unto the wicked. I'll tell you, Jesus Christ loved you enough. He came down here, put up with your dirty ways. The wages of sin is death. When you offer somebody a gospel track, if uh, you're walking away and you see them throw it on the ground, that's not because they're afraid of what's in it, they know what's in it. No matter where you are today, turn to God and place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And God Almighty got me through and got me through for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, 35 years, 40 years. You mess with that book, honey, I'll mess with you. Shame on you if you don't read the Bible. Shame on you if you don't read God. Shame on you if you don't witness with Jesus Christ. Shame on you. I like to whip that snot out of you. Sister Beck, I'll stop this effect and we're in Christ. We'll never see hell.